Verse 6. If asked, what was existing before knowing? The answer is, without consciousness existing, nothing can have being before and after knowing. How can the unknowable, the pure consciousness, have bounds? If consciousness alone is all that is, the reality of everything else just vanishes. Hi, hello and uh, welcome back to Aruvu. I've been away for a couple of months, um, been a little busy with lots of other stuff in my life. i um, very glad to be back here, here to talk about or read through the poem Aruvu, poem written by Sri Narayana Guru and of course translated and written and made easier for us by Guru Muni Prasad. Aravu translated, uh, of course, means consciousness, means knowledge. Now, I've read and reread this verse and the astounding explanations on questions like what existed before consciousness found expression has been truly transforming for me on a personal level. This verse really gives permission to throw caution to the wind, something very new for me, and go where the wind blows and in its stride, fear is whipped away. I was reminded of a time when I had to submit a project for my CSC biology and I chose photosynthesis as my subject. I was totally absorbed with this project as I tried to explain how the seed grew to form a plant, the leaves, the chlorophyll and how it catches light and transforms to energy, why the leaves lost the green colour in autumn as it started to fall for winter. I was so into this project, I even at the bottom of each page of the project, please uh, remember this is all handwritten, I lovingly drew a picture of a seed sprouting with two new leaves. At the end of the project, I was smitten with myself as I had produced a well set out project with scientific explanations of how the seed sprouted and when and how it grew, the ideal conditions it needed and it looked wonderful handed the project in and waited anxiously for the result as this project really fueled my passion, especially as I had cracked the explanation on seed germination. Years later, I realised that I know even less than I knew then of the wonderment of looking at a seed and wanting to know how it gets its DNA. How does it know how to sprout and grow and become a large tree, a bush or a vegetable producing food for us to eat? Where is the description given? I can crack open any seed and the scientists will tell me it is inside the shell. It is here and it is there. But the truth be told, no one knows how this life comes into being. Scientists can send a man to moon, but they do not know or really know what the moon is. So in truth, the more advanced we get, the more we think we know. And in reality, we do not know even a minuscule of the knowledge, the boundless, the limitless wonderment. And so, of course, consciousness is unknowable in any measured sense. But at some moment or another, when great peace descends upon us and we brush shoulders with it, albeit fleetingly, the mystery is that we and our mind know naught, 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 point, naught, 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 one percent of the mystery of the reality and of the unfolding of the consciousness. So everything that comes before, after, in between, outside of, and everywhere fathomable, and that which is not fathomable is, and everything is, one consciousness alone. I hope you enjoy this amazing, yet again amazing verse 6 of Aruva, Consciousness Knowledge, along with the unbelievable and very precious explanations given by Guru Muni Narayana Prasad in his book of shorter philosophical poems of Narayana Guru. Verse 6 
If asked, what was existing before knowing? The answer is, without consciousness existing, nothing can have being before and after knowing. How can the unknowable, the pure consciousness, have bounds? If consciousness alone is all that is, the reality of everything else just vanishes. Here is the expanded uh, explanation of this verse. It could be asked, what existed before consciousness found expression as specific experiences and the experience of the world? The only possible answer would be that with no consciousness existing to manifest itself and to know, no state of being prior to knowing can be thought of. Being what existed before knowing and after knowing, consciousness reality is unknowable. What is unknowable thus is boundless as well. When it becomes self-evident that the unknowable and boundless consciousness alone has ultimate existence before and after knowing, what seemingly exists here and now forming the visible world becomes non-existent. We understood from the last verse that consciousness alone exists after the event of knowing. Now the present verse brings to light that consciousness alone existed even before knowing. What was existing before knowing? Suppose I see an object I've never seen before. I make efforts to know what it is and finally come to a clear understanding of it and what it is good for. What existed before my arriving at this clear understanding? I was conscious then, and that is why I made the inquiry. That means, even before I gain a clear knowledge about something, consciousness was existing in me. In other words, it is the consciousness that existed even before knowing the present object that functionally assumed the form of the present knowledge of the object. This is true not only with the individuated consciousness that experiences the world. Concerning the universal consciousness of which the world is the manifest form, also the same is true. What existed before the multifarious world, or rather worlds, came into being as a known reality? The consciousness to which the existence of the world became an experience must have existed even before the experience took shape. This consciousness is termed Chit Vastu in Vedanta, Chit meaning consciousness and Vastu substance. It is not merely Chit Vastu, it is also Sad Vastu, the really existing substance. That means more than being the consciousness that experiences the world, it also is the causal substance that assumed the form of the world, or rather worlds, thus experienced. The world experience could well be compared to ornament forms. Then what existed in the place of gold is consciousness alone. Gold must have undoubtedly existed before the emerging of ornament forms. Similarly, the consciousness must have existed as the causal substance even before the emerging of world experience. Without consciousness existing, nothing can have being. Gold, in order to become an ornament, requires the artful work of an imaginative goldsmith. But it is not so with consciousness to appear as the world. Unlike gold, consciousness is life itself, is imaginatively creative on its own. Its creative urge, finding self-actualization, is what we call the creation of the world. Infinitely extensive is the artwork of creation, which thus finds expression, and our place in it is like that of a pigment particle of the paint used in some remote corner of that artwork. The point that consciousness as a cause has no brothisma abhava, posterior non-existence, was given stress to in the last verse. The present verse, in its turn, teaches that knowledge, a functional mode of the one consciousness, 
has no brag abhava either. Before becoming a pot, clay has inherent in it the potential to become that pot. In this sense, the Naya philosophy holds clay has in it the prag abhava of the pot. Prag abhava, translated as anterior non-existence, implies that a cause before becoming an effect has inherent in it the non-existence of the effect. The prefix prak means anterior to something. But in the case of consciousness, though a cause in which are inhering infinite potentials of effects, it has no brag above her, for consciousness was existing before knowing also. In other words, being a cause that has no anterior state in which the effects are non-existent, the idea of Prague Abhava is of no relevance in the case of consciousness. In short, no sort of Abhava or non-existence is predicable of consciousness as a cause. It always has Bhava or existence alone. The non-non-existent consciousness assuming manifest form, Bhavas in other words, is what we in our consciousness experiences, think of as the existence, bhava of the world. How can the unknowable have bounds? Consciousness thus has no state of being non-existent, in other words, abhava. Consciousness has neither the state in which it remains having no bhava or manifest form, another sense in which the word abhava or a bhava, meaning bhava less, is to be understood. Consciousness is the one omnipresent reality. Its facets of self manifestation are infinite, indescribable, and unknowable. The infinitely expanding universe that modern astrophysics is familiar with is merely a minute part of the self unfoldment of consciousness. We, the beings that form part of that universe, the life principle in us, our freely imagining mind, the creative faculty in us, our free will, our thinking faculty, the decisive decisions taken by us, the final conclusion we arrive at, our value notions and evaluations, all such are part of the mystery of the multifarious self-manifestations of the one consciousness that is no state of abhava, in other words, the state of being non-existent as well as the state of not self-manifesting. For example, we sow a seed and within a few days a sprout appears from it and it grows into a plant or tree that yields enjoyable fruits or vegetable. We do not see any mystery in it, but do we know how the plant or tree grows from the tiny seed? No. That this process requires the support of earth, water, air, manures and the like is what we know about it. How the actual growth happens remains unknown. We simply say it happens as part of nature or pragati. What do we know of this nature? What we do know about it is very little, and what we do not know is endless. Therefore, when we say it happens as part of pragati, we only mean we are ignorant about it. Nature or pragati in this context is a scientific term to signify our scientific ignorance of what really happens in and around us. The phenomenon of a seed growing into a plant or tree and then yielding some nourishing fruits is not treated as a mystery by us just because we see such phenomena all around us. As what we do not know about nature is far more than what we really know, it is possible that we may encounter some phenomena quite unfamiliar to us. On seeing such, we simply think of it as a miracle or even godly, as if other phenomena are not so. For example, we may happen to see a person who can produce something out of empty space. 
Do we know all the laws of nature so that we may determine that such a phenomenon is not possible? No. Nature always remains a mystery to us. As part of that mystery, many things could happen not yet known to us. The above-mentioned uncommon person is only one among such. On encountering something uncommon like that, what we should become aware of is how ignorant we are about nature. Removing our ignorance is the proper remedy for this, but we're tempted instead, again owing to our ignorance, to worship the uncommon phenomenon as well as the person instrumental to it, treating both as godly. Such is the nature of our ignorance. Freedom from this ignorance constitutes real wisdom. On the dawning of this wisdom, one realizes that everything in nature is a mystery. The greatest of all mysteries is the consciousness that mysteriously unfolds from itself everything in nature, both common and uncommon, both known and unknown, both here and hereafter. This mysterious reality does not restrict itself within the bounds of human understanding. For the human mind is simply a minute part of the mysterious self-unfolding of that very same reality. That reality, therefore, is boundless. What is boundless always remains a mystery. The reality or consciousness that is no non-existence above her, of any kind at any time, and of which the apparent manifest forms, known as bhavas, are mysteriously numerous and extensive, is thus naturally boundless. Everything bounded is a manifest form, known as bhava, appearing and disappearing in the boundless reality. All the specific and distinct knowledges about everything are merely wave-like phenomena in the ocean-like consciousness. Being thus boundless, consciousness has to be unknowable as well. Consciousness alone is all that is. It is when we become enlightened as to the unknown and boundless consciousness which alone truly exists, we start thinking about the reality of everything that we have so far been thinking of as real. We become convinced then that the various manifest forms above us of that reality, itself having no above or the state of being non-existent, were only incorrectly being thought of by us as real on their own. On intuitively perceiving that one reality, all that appeared as real disappears in the being of the real, and then the real consciousness alone is perceived in everything. One who knows the secret of the gold ornament relationship sees gold alone in all ornament forms. Similarly, on realizing that one unknowable and boundless consciousness alone is real, one begins to visualize all the apparent forms of the world as filled with the being of that unknowable reality. Thus one sees that reality alone is everything. Therefore, if asked, have you seen that consciousness reality? The only answer would be, I don't see anything other than consciousness. The very same consciousness in religions is termed God. Many who are antipathic to religions ask the question, have you ever seen the God you're talking about? The only answer would be, I see nothing other than God everywhere. We have now come to the end of verse 6. I hope you've enjoyed the verse, the explanations by Guru Muni Prasad. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope to be here again um, soon to do verse 7 and onwards. Until then, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.